Oh wait, what's going on here? And one of these. Do you okay. need to try it? Let's see. Um, do, you, do you need to origin, originate the call? Um, you missed the video. No, why don't you try it again? Just do it again. Okay. And then do you want to just sort of mute audio on the Facebook Messenger side? Or do you want to... Oh, there you are. Good to see you. Yeah, no, um, let's see, on the messenger side, yeah, we could, we could do that such that, um, let's see, voice, mute the microphone, yeah, yeah, you can still hear me? I can hear you. Excellent. Yeah, through the, through the Zencaster, yeah, and, um, if you need the audio, I could, um, I could just send, I could send you the, uh, the audio from this, if you wanted to sort of, uh, you know, sync, it's, synchronize. It's fine, I'm using OBS Studio, which records voice. That's okay, great. Okay, great. Okay, cool. Oh, this is nice. Yeah, oh, I don't good. typically get a chance to to see people while we're talking. But yeah. So that's really nice. Yeah. Oh, and Facebook lets you hide yourself. That's even better. Okay. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah. Goodness. Cool. Okay. Well, let me uh, let me see. Is there anything that you wanted to, to touch on or connect around before we... Um... Yeah, what's, uh, what's the general direction of our conversation today? Yeah, okay. Well, um, I had a few things in mind. Um, obviously, want to talk about your work and what you're up to and, and open source ecology and just mm -hmm. the kind of general um, stuff that you're doing. And then there were a couple of things in particular that, that, I, that I'd love to talk to you about. One is the whole notion of an open source economy of abundance. Mm -hmm. And then the other is around collaboration and like, how do we actually do that? Yeah. That to me seems one of the biggest challenges uh, around around these these kind of topics is like how do we collaborate? And these, uh, Huge question and one one whose discussion is much needed. So yes, let's do it. I want to ask you though. Tell me more about Buddhist Geeks. Uh, what is what is the group about? And when when have you started? And what are you doing? Yeah, yeah. So Buddhist Geeks it started as a podcast in two thousand six. Mm -hmm. And um, because of the timing and because we were exploring kind of uh, next generation kind of topics, mm -hmm. um, we kind of hit, I guess we hit some sort of wave and became popular really quickly, uh, mm. despite the fact that we had no, no idea what the hell we were doing. Yeah. Um, um, and so we sort of became sort of a new voice in the sort of millennial Buddhist um, kind of wave. And okay. we've really started off just kind of exploring how do we, how do we bring buddhism to the modern world mm -hmm. and then the and then it became more of a question well and and how does what does the modern world bring to buddhism mm -hmm. and then the whole thing just kind of split apart and really kind of has become a lot more multifaceted and um you know it's the project died for a while mm -hmm. when i t sort of died to the whole identity of buddhism and have kind of come back online with a newfound um, kind of appreciation for the deeper, the deeper truths, the mm -hmm. human stuff. Um, What's your following on, on a podcast? How many subscribers do you have? Yeah, so each one of our episodes, uh, like each month, we get somewhere between fifty and a hundred thousand downloads of the total of our whole archive. Oh wow! Uh, and I'd say each episode probably something more like thirty to forty thousand over the lifetime of the, of the episode. Nice. So they're still surprisingly, even though we died, they're still following. Uh, I guess people just didn't unsubscribe during the time. So uh, yeah, it's yeah. a decent, decent, decent little uh, community. Nice, nice. Yeah. And when you say millennial, that's people right now who are in their twenties. Uh, for me, I'm you know uh, I'd say anywhere from uh, 1980 um, to like 2000. So I'm thir in my mid 30s. I'm an elder millennial. So more mm. so people in their kind of um, you know. 20 to 40 you know that kind of range yeah 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 that that seems to be a lot of the folks i see are hanging around your yeah. kind of world as well it's true yeah yeah people who i would associate that with one one on one side i hear that a lot of millennials are missing missing hands-on skills on the other side i i'm mm -hmm. seeing that they're tired of i'm not going to work for the man i'm going to create yes. my own life yeah both both yeah. and right yeah which oh, is that'd be a, interesting to talk which about. Which is one target too. audience for our work. Yeah, absolutely. Because you're, you know, you're, you have to. People have to learn some of the skills, like the the hard skills, to be able to, 
to kind of work in the, the sort of open hardware stuff, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And and I'd say in general, I think that the tangible hands-on skills are kind of getting deprecated. We, At present, we let like people in poor countries or machines do that. So people in a Western world are losing touch with that and losing touch with this basic empowerment and productivity that's true to each of us. I think a lot of alienation in society comes from that disconnect because we're fundamentally productive and we, we like to connect to Marcia, nature. I'm sorry. I um. Yeah. I lost my I lost your audio because I'm something went something had to be fixed here on Zencaster. Apologies. One second. Yeah. Okay. I okay. Can, I can hear you now. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. No. I was saying that. Um, I think a lot of people are hungry for the the tangible like the tangible productive skill set that comes people surviving in nature and also mm -hmm. connecting to nature as the fundamental source of all our wealth. Mm. That kind of connection, that that disconnect, I think, is causing a lot of alienation and disempowerment and people and hopelessness in people. And mm. That's that's part of the the work that we try to address here. I mean, you, interesting to, to gain a democratic society, you have to be connected in that way. Otherwise, you you feel too powerless. And I and I see a lot of people uh, feel powerless about what they can do with the world. And I see. Mm that there's a huge transformation potential there that and that's that's what part of the, the product that we offer <laughs> that is uh, the ability to to reconnect to your power and i've seen that i mean from my life i mean some preaching what i've gone through it's the transformation from being you know the theoretical chalkboard uh like i talked in my ted talk to getting mm. some real hands-on skills i mean i feel i i just gotta say i i feel very powerful and that's a feeling that i've gained mm. over mm. time uh and it's relates a lot to tangible skills mm, okay cool there's i mean there's a lot of directions we could go there because we're kind of exploring i think the same phenomena from another angle like looking at the meaning crisis you know mm -hmm. and right and in, in buddhist practice we're looking at you know a big sort of focus right now is on somatic or embodied meditation which almost mm. always has an earth component where you're mm. kind of learning how to connect with the earth and inhabit the body Mm. Um, which really works to, against that sort of alienation you're talking about, and in a, from another direction. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, cool. That's same thing. Talk about. Same thing. Just a different, different perspective on it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Well, this will be fun to to talk. Yeah. Um, all right. Would you mind if we uh, go start. for it? Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. Okay. Awesome. Uh, and l let me make sure. I, so, so Marchin, I've got that, and uh, Jakubowski. Yeah. Close yeah. enough. Yeah, close enough. Uh, Polish, it's Jakubowski. Me. Jakubowski? Yeah. Okay. All right, awesome. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, Vince Horn here for another episode of Buddhist Geeks, and today I am very, very delighted to be having a conversation with Marcin, Marcin Jubikowski. Good to have you on the show, Marcin, and uh, thank you so much for taking the time to to chat with the Buddhist geeks. I'm, I'm really excited about this conversation because yeah. so much of what you're doing, I feel a, a resonance with, but it's also so different from what we're doing here. Buddhist mm -hmm. geeks. So excited to explore the intersections. Excellent. So let's dive right in. Okay. I've got my uh, bathing suit on and I'm uh, ready to go. <laughs> okay. A little cold um, here with <laughs> seven Fahrenheit in sweet Maysville, Missouri, but I'll join metaphorically. Awesome. Are you are you at the factory farm right now? Yes, that's in the Kansas City area. Okay, cool. And and I and I understand that you have also Google uh, Fiber out there. Oh, indeed. That and that's an addition since about a year now, and that's why we can have this conversation hopefully seamlessly today. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a big game changer. Fiber. We yeah we spent the money on it. We we got the pipes run here, trenched it, buried them, and got the whole facility with uh, up to four gig. Wow, that's awesome. So you've, you're awesome. kind of you're living the dream for me, which is you've got high speed gig, you know, multi gigabit internet and you're out on a farm yeah. building shit. Um, yeah. This is really cool. I'm, I'm excited to, uh, to talk about your work. So, so I, so I saw your Ted talk uh, a number of years ago. Yeah. Uh, it's probably about 10 years or so ago yeah. now, uh, something like that. And, and just immediately was like, okay, this person uh, and your partner, Katarina, y'all are doing really interesting work with the open source psychology movement. Mm hmm. And uh, that talk you spoke about the Global Construction Kit, which 
you know, last time I checked, this is like a 50 or so different yeah. um, I items that you're looking to build open source that yeah. kind of kind of would be necessary for human civilization to uh, to to, yeah. to be what it is. Global Village Construction said 50 industrial machines to cl create small scale civilization with modern comforts, essentially the critical machines from tractors to bread ovens to production equipment, to energy equipment and and cars and everything you need to create the infrastructure that's the basis of thriving then. So, you know, we can talk about then getting meditative, but you have to provide some basic needs first. Yeah, you can't you can't just, um, you know, meditate without without some basic needs. Even the yogis, the the people, they had their comfortable caves and a flame. That's right. That's right. Yeah, and some nettles to eat. You know. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, you and, and 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 you're going. I think the vision that you all have is is going well beyond that. I mean, you're talking about being able to replicate modern comforts without having to rely so much on the sort of centralized modern systems that we've all come kind of um, dependent on. Yeah, exactly. The idea is let's distribute the economy. So right now we're in a state of centralization, but the fund by fundamental design, we have a distributed world. And I think that comes from the first principle of energy. Energy is distributed. Solar energy is distributed. That's pretty much where all the power for today's economy comes from. It's from the sun, right? So by nature we have a distributed system but the way we created we kind of reformulated as humans is into a hugely centralized one so to get back to more in touch with those principles of distribution and decentralization that gives power to everybody literally and metaphorically hmm. and, and 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 so tell me a bit more about like the journey that you've been on with the global hmm. village construction set because i saw you've you've made a tremendous amount of pro uh, progress on that front you know, it's one thing to mm -hmm. hear someone give a TED talk about about something that's like an inspiring idea mm -hmm. and have some prototypes. It's another to see, you know, ten years later, yeah, you're like have made real progress on this stuff. And yeah. I'd love to hear about that. Yeah, definitely. Maybe you know, you can say at the time of the TED talk, we're a few percent done. Right now, I would quantify it as like one third done. So we've got hundreds of prototypes, like twenty or thirty unique prototypes. Uh, everything from the tractors to CNC machines, 3D printers, houses, aquaponic greenhouses. In fact, we actually added the house as a critical machine since we kind of thought, well, that's it's a living machine. Uh, it actually belongs in the Global Village construction set. But the, the power is, yeah, getting a comprehensive set along a construction set approach. So we're looking at it more as building blocks. And to derive from how Linux open source software has derived, one of the keys to its success was large modular breakdown into very small parts so you can have thousands of people working on at the same time. And that's exactly what we do with hardware. Break it down into modules and development steps for each module. So we're inching along at the time of the TED Talk. I kind of felt like I missed my great opportunity because I had so many people contact me and all of mm -hmm. that and we didn't have an organization and we hardly have an organization right now we really don't yet we're not at that level of having a business so to say like a real a solid organization but we do have a lot of foundational work i think we're i would call ourselves an exponential organization it's laying a solid foundation with all the prototyping that we have done yeah and now ready to to convert that to economic impact so transitioning from the pr plain prototyping to to the i to the next step, which a lot of open source product projects forget, and that is a product. <laughs> so what are right. you know what are the products that we can offer that anyone anyone can use? Okay, that's cool. I mean, it's interesting. I'm thinking back to when I I got even more kind of interested in y'all's work, and I think at a certain point, I started to really feel this kind of pull to be sort of subtract myself out ourselves out of the sort of capitalist system a bit more mm -hmm. to be able to offer you know uh, meditation teaching more freely mm -hmm. you know, to be a little less dependent on a pay for service model mm -hmm. and you know so one of the big questions that comes up is like okay well around like housing costs mm -hmm. and how do you you know how do you reduce your costs like housing is like one of the major costs yeah so I said, you know and you all were some of the only people that were talking about being able to build and an, you know uh, an ecologically sustainable, you know, house for like twenty-five grand. Yeah, 
and that's unheard of, you know, to, to be able to hit those kind of um, n those numbers. And and that's what I think is really interesting about what what you're trying to do is you're you're really setting a goal of kind of price reduction that really competes with the capitalist markets on their own terms in a way that's hard for them to you know, be hard if you're actually able to pull this off <laughs> for companies to, uh, to to have any response to a tenth of the price house or tractor or you know brick press or, or all the things that you're building yeah uh, that's exactly right so let's dive into it there's actually a very interesting page like when I look at the wiki statistics there's a page on our wiki open source ecology org uh, slash wiki which is cost of living and you said mm. it the number one cost of living is housing so on average I have some stats here and it's sixty eight hundred dollars a year then the second one is your car thirty four hundred dollars mm. a year and then food twenty six hundred dollars a year and yeah it adds up to about twenty thousand or so just let's see that the number actually is twenty thousand uh, per year per person according to the Bureau of Lab Labor Statistics for a household Oh, it doesn't sound too too bad but um, the idea is let's so let's go for example to the CDCA home just to show you like a very tangible example so in a CDCA home you mentioned twenty five thousand dollars okay but where is the labor that's materials mm -hmm. so in our model what we aim to do is provide a turnkey service of uh, the, the model that we built that you see me in right now you can show show the link below the video later yeah but the model there is a client pays probably like a ten thousand dollar service fee we host a workshop where we swarm on the build in a, with about 50 or so people and build that in five days mm. and i think that the more like a turnkey cost to the client would be more like seventy thousand that's kind of what if we if you actually start you know full cost accounting like the twenty five thousand yes. dollars is materials yes so you'd have to figure out how to do it but we did with a swarm based build the idea there is you are providing an immersion education so basically you're selling an experience that people participate in and get a lot of skills have a lot of fun shatter some of the limits in their mind about what's possible in terms of effective building using a, a very collaborative learning rich learning environment that's very supportive so that's the product we're trying to develop and probably if we look at the economics probably like seventy thousand dollars for a, a house builder a, a basically the house the, the person who wants to have the house but for a 1400 square foot house so yeah. still about one That's third crazy. the cost of industry standards right if we actually right. roll this out so there's a whole organization that have to be behind it and so forth but that's kind of how it looks right now now of course if you're a skilled guy and you've got a family that can build that well you're not gonna be able to do it in five days but over a month you can take our modular construction methods because everything in the system is designed to be handled by people not not for example cranes or large machines the, mm. the way we design the modular construction method lends itself to a swarm build with normal people and really reducing the skill set by essentially trying to turn this into Legos as much as possible mm, that's interesting and and, and it's from what I gathered, like everything that you're doing, the documentation around the processes, like everything is part of the open source model, like everything is shared. shared Absolutely open. everything. And there's two levels. So one is the design. Second mm. is the enterprise design. And that's that this is where we talk about the concept of distributive enterprise. Yes. So the idea, if we do it and it's good for the world, everyone can use it. And, and people in a modern society people think that you have to be proprietary or you have to have a competitive advantage based on IP mm -hmm. in order to win here our competitive advantage or collaborative advantage mm -hmm. is the, the opposite it's the fact that we're collaborating and if you think about it if you were in kindergarten you'd understand it because at that point we kind of were taught to to share but from high school into college on we're completely taught the opposite and Right now, there's a huge cultural barrier that prevents people from comprehending that, hey, we can actually do more together and annihilate the, uh, the uh, material scarcity issues that are still central to life in the West and in the developing world. So yeah. it's a mind shift. 
that's interesting, and it, it's it's so easy to see that happening in the in the software world over the last. Mm. Well, it's easy to see it happening, and then it's easy to see the forces of centralization happening as well. Yeah, because um, that's that's very real with Facebook and and Google and Amazon. Yeah, let me and let me expand on that because there's a very important number. It's it's a uh, Gini coefficient. I don't know if you've heard of that. Gini coefficient is a measure of the actual distribution no. of wealth, and zero is when everybody the next has as much wealth as the next person one is where one super ruler has all the wealth in the world mm -hmm. well we're pretty close to that because eight of the and actually the figure is like six of the world's richest billionaires have as much wealth as the bottom 50 percent at the bottom of the pyramid so it's it's about uh so historically the gini coefficient has been around four currently it's about in industrial revolution when that measure started to be taken or at least people have studied it right now we're at about 0.7 Whoa. and when you look at it it's not you'd think that around 2000 uh the digital age that that thing would collapse back down and we're getting the long tail getting into uh wealth being distributed more equitably but that is clearly not the case i mean it may be there may be some hints of it possibly dropping it but it's not clear so no the, the promise has not happened it's been a decade or two since that possibility became very real through digital yes. transference of of know-how and digital fabrication or the infinite sharing of knowledge that has happened but wealth has not become distributed it's, it's getting concentrated by yeah some, some measures yeah that, that that makes sense and it's i mean that seems to be one of the biggest crisis points that we're facing the inequality crisis and the demo you know it's connected to democracies the crisis of democracy indeed for sure and um you know you and i were talking a little bit about uh, there's a one theorist who i really like john verveke talks about the meaning crisis and awakening mm. from the meaning crisis you know you, you were saying a little bit about your own journey and kind of uh the the journey of becoming empowered um to, to be able to actually have the power to to do the things that you're doing um to build your own house and to build your own uh, equipment to grow your own food um, I mean this is something that I, I, I sort of feel like is um, you know it, it there are a lot of YouTube videos of people that are kind of doing these sort of extreme experiments and it seems you know like wow amazing someone can grow their own food mm -hmm. um, but it's not something that most of us know how to do um, I've just started gardening myself and it's it's you know it's it's no it's no small task to uh to, to to produce enough food to take care of yourself or to you know to build your own house right um, could you talk about your journey in terms of going from i think it was like you're a phd student yeah. in uh in uh, uh yeah. Fusion yeah yeah some physics to like where you are now which seems to be oh yeah apart. oh it's a it's a great story i love it because uh, in the second year of my phd actually so you heard me talk about that theoretical chalkboard where you know in the first year you know you enter your program i was still at that point thinking oh yeah science great physics we're gonna do something good for the world i actually went into fusion which is the energy that happens on the sun we're trying to tame it bring it down to earth since then i've of course migrated to okay let's talk about more like solar energy that the fusion that comes to the earth that we're not creating on earth uh, lots of complexities there but as i got thrust into this theoretical program uh, l lots of you know coursework which on things that don't exist it's like wow you know I went to a professor once and, and I asked him what this long equation meant he said oh that actually doesn't exist I just made it up it's like okay people we're talking about things that do not exist yet there are very tangible issues we need to solve for the be betterment of all humanity so what's the disconnect here um, so actually in a second year and this is this relates to your audience and that is in a second year I I took a what's known what was called a lifestyle engineering course with a local yoga teacher in Madison Wisconsin so I learned how to breathe meditate cook Indian food and pretty much completely disconnected from my program I kind of said okay um, mm. I started coming in at like noon and it's like why can't I it's like I could set my own schedule or whatever but I pretty much disconnecting I, I, I ended up doing more independent study on all the sustainability stuff that I was now getting um, really interested in mm. and um, almost actually getting kicked out a couple of times I actually failed my prelim 
uh, in which I in case I had to I had another three months to okay study up or or get out so I just totally cranked down and I have the ability to focus pretty well so I could I actually passed it but yeah it was an interesting thing the last year of the PhD uh, I noticed some of the other artifacts of the school were that I could not talk openly about my research to others and mm. that was like man what's going on we're a public institution yet the mechanisms in there don't even allow me to learn freely from others so i i started thinking about open source one guy in my group actually introduced me to linux around the 2000 mark i was like mm. oh wow this is cool this is a system that's free you can download it you can modify it you can use it um at that point we we're using Macs. so when i saw that it's like wow look at there's there's other ways to do things no so that mm. was an eye-opener for me and I felt mm. that this idea that it's free and you can actually modify it and and create software for it was great. And people are actually collaborating together to make that happen just voluntarily. Like, wow, that's a great idea. And I started thinking about what, what it would really look like if we truly collaborated throughout society. So start formulating the ideas of open source ecology. Um, basically, uh, a project with a mission to say, okay, what happens when we actually open access to all the fundamental knowledge? And at that point, I, th I definitely thought a lot about hardware, hardware knowledge. That has to be critical because that's that is the life stuff of modern civilization. You know, the abundant resources of society are what makes our advanced society happen. But then that becomes all scarce. So coming from Poland, also that's the other critical ingredient. I came from Poland. Tanks were rolling down my streets in 1984 when I came. Wow. So I saw a transition from communism to this amazing supermarket with everything there whereas in Poland I would have to wait in line for food and stuff like that with my parents uh, how old were you were at that time 10 oh wow at 10 I came over to the US and but a transition from uh, things being rationed and tanks rolling down your streets and a kind of a gray world like I must say that the communist regime really crushes people's spirit um, so this great optimism that came about in America, yeah, just wrote on that and uh, really enjoyed it. And it was great and easy and just kept going. But to the point that, yeah, uh, my father was a scientist, so he encouraged me to go into science, and I did that. But the farther I went, the, the more alienated I felt. So actually the last year of the PhD, which was about 2004, um, I started the project, organized that in Madison and, and carried down the mission. But that wasn't, I, I did not coin the phrase Global Village Construction Set at that time. That came a, a couple of years later when I went and got a piece of land and settled on a farm and recognized that I have no practical skills whatsoever. <laughs> like I read all the books and I thought I was hot. Yeah, just let me at it. And then you get killed by things like weeds or equipment breaking down. And the fact that stuff is expensive, the story with the tractor that broke and I had to pay to get it repaired and it broke again. Uh, all of that really hit and I found I was absolutely unprepared. And it's like, why? We have access to all this knowledge. Why is, why is it not available? We have the tools. We have the knowledge. Why couldn't I make it work? Because I thought I knew everything. So, so that's when it started. And I said, okay, if I'm having this problem, then I, I, I might as well solve this problem for anyone else who does uh, who is in a similar condition, which would be many people who try to start any kind of whatsoever, any kind of civilization reboot experiment, yeah. <laughs> whether it's uh, meditation or starting a community or starting a school, a business or whatever that, that tries to break the patterns of the, the modern economy. It's very hard because there's just not a lot of resources there. I mean, and that's why I get excited about your work because it seems like you're trying to kind of provide the basic building blocks for other people to be able to kind of continue to build on that that vision of an open source economy of abundance. And I, I don't yeah. want to get too idealistic here because it's really like this is really hard stuff that you're doing. Um, like I see you posting pictures every day of prototyping of you know iterating on on things, and it's like you're doing like. You're 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 like messing with like wood and metal and, and atoms you know, and atoms and trying to like figure out how to build this stuff. Yeah, the uh, to continue on what you just said is this is not about idealism. This is about hard skills of radically efficient production, and that's kind of me talking out of communism. Like communism was 
very inefficient in what it did. Uh, it was still a very centralized system. So yes, um, but the the kind of stories here at the begin early days of our farm, it's like. Well, how do we get to this industrial productivity on a small scale? So I started to find hints that that's possible. Build the brick press, build the first tractor, and so like, wow, these things produce. Like for and the surprise was quite positive. Like an in initial brick press, I was hoping to get like three bricks per minute. I knew nothing about hydraulics or or metal work. I learned all of that on a spot because I had a fire under my butt to do it, and then the initial brick press produced 10 bricks a minute it was crazy so so the technology works but we have to have the access to it yeah so it's not it's not easy in the sense that yeah you basically have to reinvent a kernel for for a collaborative civilization starting at the hardware level not easy there's a lot of logistics and details to it over software uh, but the metaphor is clearly there linux is an operating system for computers mm. which run mm -hmm. our lives Open source ecology is an operate, operating system for an, a new economy. And just like with the operating system for software, there's just a bunch of elements it has. There's a kernel. And once you have it, you can do anything with it. Mm. Now, here, here's a question on, on a sort of personal level. So, like, I, I'm, I'm working on growing microgreens right now. Yeah. And, and, and have just the first several batches have just been like a lot of mold. And, I'm, and I'm, I'm sort of back to the drawing board. And, and I just noticed, like, it's been a month since I've tried again because I'm sort of deflated. Sorry, and, it was the first batch was what? A, a pot of gold just, or not? Just, uh, no, a bunch of mold. A bunch of mold. <laughs> mold oh. Moldy, moldy, moldy microgreens. Okay. Yeah, I wish. I wish. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there's that sort of experience of, like, okay, I'm trying this thing. It doesn't work. And there's that sort of a, a deflation, you know, the experience of just, like, ah, oh, failure. How, yeah. How, because I'm sure this is something you've dealt with time and again. Oh, yeah. How, like, what's kept you going through those multiple failures to continue on with this project? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a thing. I, I mean, I, I must say that I cracked that thing inside out, but it's, it's just a vision. It's a mm -hmm. much bigger vision, greater than myself. And when you think about that, I know it's possible, right? So it's inspiring to first of all create that for myself and create it at the same time for many others who go through the same breakthroughs that I do. And that's what drives me because that new reality, it's all in my head already. I'm acting as if it were to exist. And that, that's where I would say my confidence or continuous drive comes from. Mm. It's uh, one, I'm a stakeholder and I want to uh, help others too. Okay. Okay, that's interesting. So, so could you describe either what the vision is or what you've seen, like in retrospect, what is the path? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, oh, the vision ahead. is clear that we liberate, we free our lives from material constraints, so we can move on to personal human evolution. Like, what is that? You know, ask yourself, what is that that you truly want to be doing now and would be doing if you had no cons material constraints, like you need to get a house or a car or pay your bills what would it be and it's sad that the majority of people do not get the chance to do that and that's uh, perhaps even worse in a developed world than the developing world I mean right uh, we're not doing what we want to do we we're trapped so the the promise of freedom is as great as ever and it's this same promise that all religion or anyone has ever promised it's a great ideal that we want to strive for and the reality of that is we can do that through personal responsibility to to make that happen to commit to that and mm. start doing it and 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 you said you can kind of look back and see you know see people kind of coming through coming up through the same um, kind of territories having the same breakthroughs like there's some it Definitely. sounds like there's some kind of path you know and I I'm kind of likening this to the sort of contemplative path where mm. there are these sort of clear, deep patterns of experience when people start to train their attention and mm -hmm. open their hearts. You know, there's something very universal or human about, about the journey. Mm -hmm. um, how would you describe the, the journey that, that you see or the path that you see people kind of taking toward, toward this sort of vision of, mm -hmm. of, uh, of freedom that you're talking about? Yeah, I, I, 
I think right now I'm seeing some good examples because we're running this immersion program for three months this summer and so, so some of the students that have already signed up, the kind of message I get from them, just being able to build something that's tangible is super empowering, even if it's like a silly thing. Um, so the idea that you can change your material world in a tangible way, that's a, that's a powerful one. So, so a little aha mm -hmm. moment that says, wow, I can, like say it's, say it's 3D printing an object like that you designed. Mm -hmm. It's like, wow, that can have an, a breakthrough moment for people, the aha moment, like even though like it could be some silly thing like a paper holder, not something that's got a billion dollar value right there, but something small, but shows you that you've done it, you were responsible, you, you see your agency, you build your agency in the mm. world. Uh, that is the, the breakthrough. So it starts with the ability to see that you can do something that you didn't think you could do before. Yes. And then when you deepen that experience, you see how that relates to making, to transforming the world. Because no longer do we start thinking, oh, the reality is as it is around us. We are actual, actually the authors of that reality. And right now we, we relegate that role to the corporation or to a business that does that. So mm -hmm. most people are not in a mindset that says, hey, this is up to us. This is kind of like, uh, like in the movie, It's a Wonderful Life the same thing like each one of us is so responsible you, you know what i'm talking about yes each one of us is responsible for making that kind of transformation by the choices that we make and if people have that if people get to that level that's that's beautiful and that's that's mm. what we're trying to show so um mm. and i i want to keep going to uh, what we're doing this summer because this summer it's the yeah. first time we're producing a three month immersion program where you take yourself from zero to quite a capable producer maker. Um, mm. And the idea there is essentially like in, in these three months, you'll probably learn more th than you ever would in terms of practical skills across more disciplines that, that you probably would in a lifetime anywhere else. So this is what our current step at doing that yes immerse people give people a tangible opportunity to build i mean starting on the first day we actually build a 3d printer on the very first day and we nice. continue that along the modular approach just real deep dive in a supportive environment and you're building all kinds of things up to the the machines and houses at the end that you start to now understand yes this i now i understand how it works there are um building modules like the legos where we start to understand how the modules work and we p work on putting them together and that's a transformative experience so taking yes. anybody at any skill level is very important because the engineer could perhaps re-engineer the module and make a different one mm -hmm. the user the less skilled person can take our free cad lesson the ability to take those existing modules already and build with them without having to actually re-engineer them. So, so you can enter this process at any level, high or low, while still making a, a collaborative effort. And that kind of gets into, well, how the hell do you get all these people with all different kinds of skill sets to collaborate effectively on that? And that's yes. a question of mindset and skill set. Okay, interesting. Well, let's go into that because you're, you're talking a lot about sort of um, empowering at the level of agency, mm -hmm. you know, at the individual agency, and yet that that vision that you're describing is also a, a, a collective one, a collaborative one. It requires a bunch of empowered agents to work together toward a toward a shared vision. Yep. Um, and that's where I found some some challenge, um, um, in, in, you know, in my work and in in, in, the, in the networks that I'm part of, where that people start to get that sort of sense of self-authorship mm. but then there's sort of the still the sense of like well but i have my vision and you have your vision mm -hmm. and we, we and we it's hard for us to kind of compromise enough or figure out a way a, a deeper way to engage with each other um such such that we actually are putting that sort of empowered agency to work together yeah um what so, so say, say more about the mindset and skill set thing because i i'm, I'm yeah. really curious to see what you've learned about this I mean, you really have to do that, which, you know, like pe people like Peter Diamandis talk about in the book Bold, but it's the big, hairy, audacious goal, the massive transformative purpose. 
So mm. if you can identify one that embodies a lot of people, then you're pretty golden. And for us, we're just saying, oh, we're going to create a new kernel for civilization or its technological base. Well, that's a large vision. If you add a number to it, that's like 30 trillion of value in the primary and secondary sectors of the economy. So we're starting with a big vision. So it has to be something that's that you can get a lot of people behind. And from then, you have to work on the basic tools, tool sets and tool sets that enable it to happen. But the mindset is one that simply says we are transitioning beyond, beyond the scarcity mindset into abundance, simply saying, okay, in an economy, you can have Unilever producing your paper towels or John Deere producing tractors. Well, our idea is let's distribute that to every community. Every community, you can create an open source micro factory where you have a huge repository of collaboratively generated design produced locally. Same old, same old. I mean, that's I'm not saying anything new. That's been around 10 or 20 years with that explicit vision. Uh, spoken by people like Neil Gershenfeld with Fab, the Fab Labs, and other people. There's an initiative called Fab City. Every city produces uh, it's what it needs. Um, no new ideas here. It's just about executing it. But, but the idea is for people is to get into this. Uh, what I found very recently is the, the, the concept that, oh, we can actually do this. We can make these products, which have more economic power than than we can find people to hire. It's, that's not an issue. But people can't get around the idea that, okay, well, then let's start collaborating on this product and that product, and let's start producing things locally. That's hard. Uh, I would say primarily because of the cultural mindset that says, well, how am I going to make money? People immediately go back to their reptilian brain of 10,000 years ago and get yes. scared. And discussion yes. stops. Yeah. Okay. So, th which which connects back with this whole kind of notion of scarcity, and and sort of fear. And it's interesting because part of my experience on on the sort of coming up as a contemplative, I was a computer engineering student, mm. and then I dropped out to meditate full time. Nice. And so I t I sort of took a different different track and came back around uh, to technology, but from the point of view of um, you know kind of a Buddhist kind of paradigm of awakening mm -hmm. where it is very much about uh recognizing that sort of the ego contraction you know the sense of self-contraction yeah. is not fundamentally who i am and what we are that there's some way in which the technologies and tools the psycho technologies of meditation help one deconstruct that self-contraction and to discover an abundance which is beyond sort of uh, what we think, you know, what we think this is, and but that's a beautiful thing to wake up to. But then it's really hard to realize that, and then be living in this reality where mm -hmm. that is not how our society is structured. It doesn't actually uh, that kind of awakening isn't reflected in our economics in any way, right? Or in, our, in our cultural system, so there's a real disconnect yeah. between the inner experience of that freedom of abundance and the actual oh yeah um, systems of, that we live in and i see that a lot of contemplatives we struggle with that and and it's like we need what you know the kind of vision that you're talking about to kind of sync up the interior and the exteriors um so that they're they're sort of co co arising are you suggesting that n our inherent nature we tend to contract as and be scarce as opposed to abundant is that did you say that or I, I'd say it, it's both and that we have this one part of our nature that yeah. does contract and then this other yeah. part of our nature which is not is you know it, it's it holds expansion and contraction both you know it doesn't mm -hmm. reject anything um, uh, absolutely that the thing I say about that it's our choice we choose that we have enough agency mm -hmm. if we strip our free ourselves from some certain constraints that might dictate otherwise to us but no we have the People need to recognize that we, ha as individuals, have that agency to decide which path we take. Mm. So it's not—it's a choice somebody has to make. Yeah, and I, 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 I get that, but and, and it's a, and it's it's a it's a leap. It's a leap of faith to to, to make that choice because there's there's no there's uh, you know it's like going off into the to the underbrush and like yeah they're ideas and they're pioneers and they've they've, they've carved a little bit of a way but there's not you know there's not always a clear path through. Yeah, yeah, and I mean the only thing like what I what I gotta say why why I feel really empowered at this juncture in the history of our project is because I think we we're kind of starting to nail this disconnect 
between vision and execution. Mm. Okay, so t a decade ago, the you know more than that, the s original vision of OSC has been enunciated. But only right now are we connecting that to material reality, and that material reality is entrepreneurship. It's enterprise. It's producing real things, livelihood for people, mm -hmm. right? And yes. I feel really good about where we're going with that right yes. now through some of the entrepreneurial activity that we're start starting. And I think we're on the beginning of a curve that we're really going to take off pretty soon. That's cool. I mean, I see that because you're, um, I think, the, the distributive enterprise that you talk about. Um, yeah. I saw that you're working on exactly. kind of creating a competitive version of the, uh, of the electric uh, drill. drill. For example. And that sounds like, you know, something that's, there's a lot of potential there. You could actually create a, a scalable, distributed model. Um, Can we talk compete. about that for a second? Please, I'd love to hear more. Well, because the idea here is like we're we're stuck in this point. Okay, how do we connect this vision to to what we do for a living, right? And the point is that the entire economy lends itself to thousands of opportunities for that. So we're trying to show that. Okay, here's an example where open source, absolute collaborative, distributive development is yielding livelihoods that are simply displacing the status quo. What is the status quo? So that'll be, the say, the $10 billion cordless drill industry. Well, well yeah. why not instead of four large companies having 80% share of the market, why don't we distribute that to hundreds or thousands of producers worldwide by simply showing, okay, let's get a bunch of people together. There's a concept called open source. There's digital mm -hmm. fabrication like 3D printers, and there's mm -hmm. wikis and docs that you can share information infinitely in FreeCAD where you can design anything uh, in an open source infrastructure. And then you've got Linux open source computers. So you've got this whole infrastructure where you can do this collaboratively. So why doesn't it happen? Why don't we simply say we're going to make something better, faster, stronger? Because the, the big guys, they're inefficient. At the end of the day, they're inefficient. Everyone, all of them are competing with their own R&D departments to make a better product. Mm -hmm. You would naturally think that, oh, well, if we get a bunch of people working together in a refined process, that process needs to be evolved. It has to be an effective process. But if we get a bunch of people and mm -hmm. then we say, okay, how about instead of the 80% of that wealth generated going to stockholders, it actually goes to us. Mm -hmm. How can you beat that idea? That's a good idea. Let's execute on it and make it happen. So we think that this will succeed if we can execute on the notion of a massive redistribution of wealth from the few to the many. Uh, concrete example being, okay, that you have the cordless drill investors for Black & Decker or whatever. This and that. They're getting all the value that others produce. Designer doesn't really benefit too much. The workers do not benefit that much. So we're saying, let's shift that. Let's have 80% of the actual workers, the collaborators, the designers, the producers in many, many communities do that all over the world. And now we have this massive inversion of power relations throughout the world with a very concrete example. Now a drill, it's manageable. It's a manageable project. It lends itself to open source 3D printing lends mm -hmm. itself to a large collaborative effort. There's battery packs, there's motors, there's the chuck, there's the body, there's various electronics elements. There's, you can break it down, you can open source it, you can 3D print it. And also on top of that, we're saying we're gonna take waste plastic and we're gonna make it from that using a filament making open source mm -hmm. machines that are part of that challenge. So the challenge involves the fact that you're gonna design the drill design the fabrication infrastructure for that drill from waste plastic and your open source franchising the business model so mm -hmm. people can replicate it either independently or part of our group under the OSC brand. So our explicit goal is 100 to 200 people at the conclusion of this incentive challenge mm -hmm. who will be producing this cordless drills, drill in many places around the world. The challenge will be $250,000 prize it will mm. run for six months, and the kickoff is September 2nd this year. So this is going to be, I'm looking at this as, a, as, an, as, a, as an economic experiment and social experiment to change the world. Mm, that's cool. And if this experiment goes well, I'm imagining you've got a template for, for, for doing this across, uh, across multiple um, items. Exactly, tools. exactly. So if this okay. works, 
the model can be applied to the potentially a waterfall shed watershed moment in human history that's being you know that's being very ambitious about it that's the potential let's see how far that we can achieve but it's not going to be about me i'm going to set some rules that you know the core osce team we're going to set up the infrastructure for that to happen but it's not about us and we're very clear about that it's about everybody building upon each other's work because let me tell you one thing so hero x the mm -hmm. incentive challenge platform yeah uh, it's an offshoot of the x prize every single project there it blew me away is not collaborative it's you have teams say 500 teams they all compete against each other the rules explicitly say you cannot copy from other people well invert that let's make the rules that you are for, required to copy for and build upon others and continuously upload to the repository and you you are all doing it together we'll have multiple prizes we'll have to get a clear judging structure and all that but it's it just kind of blows me away that okay even in these challenges which some of them are supposed to be for common good projects including mozilla to, to mm. give, give an example is their hero x challenge they they actually weren't collaborative because it was still teams again and against other teams and mm. second only the winner they actually had to have the winner be open source but the, all the other entrants weren't required to be open source that's how they ran it so uh, the combo so it's like a bunch of waste yeah so all that other work it's like it wasn't even open source so mozilla is a open source leader in the world and even they are not designing it to be collaborative or fully open source so we're going to be very mm. clear we're collaborative and we're open source period and let's see what happens mm, okay cool i like that um so so here's kind of an intersection point on the collaboration yeah. thing i wanted to talk to you about and we we i think we had a, sh a short email exchange about this but um you know one of the things that i've been involved in is a kind of movement of teaching and translating meditation uh, practices that are traditionally done in silence by yourself mm -hmm. Of DIY style meditation and translating those to social uh, methods to yeah. actually meditate out loud with other people and there's something really interesting that's come mm. in the last several years of doing that and it's well, we, and we've open sourced um, so we've open sourced those methods by the way so 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 we're following you know, following your footsteps here are, are is that available online can, can you send me a link or send it in the yeah, absolutely. It's, a, it's socialnoting.guide is the, the method that we're um, teaching right now. And, you know, the idea is, you know, anyone can actually come and teach those methods. Um, you don't have to even train with me or go through any sort of certification process. We do have a training so that if people want to get the support and skills necessary to do it, kind of a little bit like your immersion mm -hmm. experience. It's like people don't have to come for three months to do the immersion, but if they do, they're going to gain a lot of skill. And being able and feeling empowered to be able to do this stuff for real um so so similarly I, i'm kind of thinking of it in the same way and and to me these social meditation methods they, they provide a type of experience wherein one really starts to get that i'm not just this sort of separate self over here having this completely separate experience yeah. and, and and i have no connection with you and you know our destinies aren't intertwined our our consciousness is inter intertwined mm. you know there's a sense of just kind of isolated separateness mm. um that, that, that kind of dissolving or, or, or feeling the kind of more permeability of, of that to me that's that it feels like again catching a glimpse of of that sort of vision that you're sharing um absolutely you know, i mean when you and, describe uh, that that's how i feel like uh during our extreme build process mm. it's you're doing something that you could not do yourself right. and so you 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 have exactly what we do like in the spiritual field uh, but it's deeply related to what we do because you need that kind of a a mindset this kind of recognition that oh okay yeah we can actually do better together or we are related what i do affects you and if i yeah. make something better for the world you can benefit from it and i can benefit from you it's it's so synergistic there's a mutuality yeah um, that 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 emerges there yeah and uh, again like i I'm, I'm curious how much of this for you has been or, or how much would you frame it as a spiritual journey um like a, a journey of transforming identity or transforming your relationship to reality yeah well i would say that's that's the core of it i would say mm. 
80 20 mm. uh, because what I'm doing right now would not be happening if I did not do what you described mm -hmm. so I meditate every day myself uh, oh, you I do? do? My oh yeah yoga cool. meditation every day since that I was uh, what was it 25 and a lifestyle engineering teacher in Madison Wisconsin so, so, so tell me about your meditation what do you what do you do in, in your practice? What, I do like? um, start with a what's more like a Kundalini yoga kind of deal. So basically, like all the shakes to get my body up and going. Then I prepare my chai. Um, I do that. That's my ritual. That uh, complete ritual. Go to cola tea. I don't know if you know mm -hmm. that. You know go to cola. No. no, I don't. Go to cola is a psychoactive tonic. Oh, it sounds nice. And. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what talks to me every morning <laughs> so I, I can pretty much connect so so I kind of establish so the connection to the infinite computer I plug in and and then mm. sit on a chair and meditate for like half an hour or so um, mm. just uh, I don't know what you call it exactly I think it's uh, I mean it's it's where you basically reduce your senses so I so I have mm. earplugs I close my eyes and have a hat and like eliminate all the external noise and just kind of listen what's inside and what what comes up and through that just a lot of creativity comes about so that's the kind of process mm -hmm. I go through and then I'm mm -hmm. pumped I'm on fire to to do that transition of because it's so very spiritual or high thoughts like of infinite possibility collaboration and all that come into my mind and then I get up and just start doing it so a, I love a complete that. transition from okay there's that vision and then I just start doing it every day so it's great. Mm. I love this. This is, uh, I mean, you know, just to, you know, you got the audience that listens to this to does, you know, pursue, pursue some kind of a meditative practice, but man, that's just one of the tools we have not learned to develop as humans. I mean, that should be taught in school. I mean, it's mm. just basic capacity of, of humans, um, to still yourself and to, and, and to control your mind or body and breathing in different ways than just standard noise. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. That's I, I am not surprised at all that, that that's part of your daily routine and ritual. Yeah, um, but uh, it's cool to hear about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Definitely. And it's interesting, you know, the the vision that you're talking about. You know, when you're talking about that vision and how it really it's you've emphasized this a few times. It's not about me or about us. It's a, it's about kind of making this available for everyone. Um, you know, to me, it, it, what you were sharing, it had, it had um, kind of overtures of this idea in the Buddhist tradition of the Bodhisattva, you know, the, the, the being who is trying to not just wake up for themselves, but is trying to help everyone awaken. And, and, and yeah. really the core of the Bodhisattva is driven by, well, one, wisdom, like seeing how things are, but also compassion. Mm -hmm. You know, there's this deep sense of really wishing and wanting to alleviate the suffering of the world. Yeah. And that there's something about that that feels to me, it's like it's it's in the times that I've really experienced that deep sense of compassion and awareness, it's boundless. You mm -hmm. know, it's beyond, it's transpersonal, it's boundless. It's uh, it, 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 it's like a non, it's like, it's like a renewable source of energy. Yeah. That it never be, you know, you can never draw enough compassion down to like empty the well. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. So I feel that in your, you know, in your description and, and what you're doing. And that's the answer to the question you said before. How do you not burn out? You have mm. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but w would you say, take, w would you, I mean, because, but there is a process, though, of like, of that sense of fear or, you know, uh, doubt coming up, arising, uh, you know, again and again, like, oh, well, yeah. maybe I'm not going to be able to do this. Maybe it's too much. Maybe it's going to take too long. Maybe we, you know, like those kind of things. Are they, I mean, I'm assuming that that still arises for you, that you still have to kind of work with and process. The Absolutely. Sort of fear and, you know, but here I'll call, call on to two other bodies of human knowledge that we need to be aware of. One is general semantics. How do we think? How do we process language? There's a book by that name by a Polish guy. It's a seminal book in a, in on human thought. So if you're a Buddhist, that that could I would suggest that's actually some s fundamental reading. Uh, mm. uh, not to be haughty here in any way, but from general semantics also comes the study of mental models. Like mm -hmm. how do we think? And uh, mental models like 
okay, is that like really an impossibility or is that just what I think? So it's combining yeah. psychology. Now, the people that talk about mental models, cognitive bias. Mm. Um, so Charlie Munger, so that's the partner of Warren Buffett, the richest person in the world or whatever. Uh, those guys talk about that. The leaders of the world understand leaders. I mean, the modern, the people who are idolized today, the people with mm. money. They understand the concepts of mental models and, and cognitive bias. So this is like the Buddhism is all about breaking through your cognitive biases. It's all there. Uh, so studying that helps, like just really looking at mental models and cognitive biases mm -hmm. as framed through the framework of general semantics, which in essence says that's the map is not the territory. That's where we say what you perceive is not reality, yes. right? That's a Buddhist thing, right? You say you guys say that too, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's one half of it. Um, yeah, that 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 there's a kind of emptiness uh, to our ideas and concepts that they're not fixed. Um, and yet, the other half of it is like, and our 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 ideas and our models on one level are also all we have. Um, without them, we we have you know we're just like yeah catatonic yeah breathing yeah. beings. It's that big elephant, um, well, the big elephant, our brain, like it's, it's that elephant in the room, we've got to tame it, that big <laughs> elephant that if you let it, it's going to cause havoc if it's untamed, yes. but if you, if you can tame it, it can be very powerful to, to some really good ends. Yeah. So this is really, I mean, this is all about, yeah, I mean, you have to deal with that as, so, you know, myself as a person striving to learn in all ways and be a an un movement entrepreneur, mm. I study this stuff as in like the mental models, cognitive bias, coaching. I mean, I get, started getting into this, like I had pretty much, I would say like a few years ago, I kind of went through a low when maybe like three years ago, I went through a low where I, I noticed that this shit ain't going anywhere. You know, I, I said all this stuff, you know, I put out some plans, nobody's re replicating, not nobody, but it's not gaining traction as in major yes. replication all kinds of enterprises starting all over the place and all that there are some there's a few dozen but it's economically insignificant and when i saw that it's like okay so i think this is a cool idea what's up and <laughs> mm -hmm. and then uh then i thought that that's when that distinction between vision and execution that part really started to hit me and that's when i said okay gotta just step up my game and that's called uh Mm. the entrepreneurship part mm. pick up some skills of execution management and how do you actually turn this into reality so definitely a, just a whole new wave of learning getting healthy again i.e like exercising every day because farm life mm. is actually pretty hard on your body yeah so one thing i do right now every day i, I, I do my exercises like half an hour uh, i do p90x3 um stuff I do my meditation in the morning, but but really pay attention to the body. Yeah, that's you got to do it to your food, to your spirit, mm. to your intellect. You got to pay nurture all of that, and then you're just gonna start. It's gonna be much easier to break through those, like you say, uh, mm. the things that are always telling us you yeah. can't do it. Now nah, just forget about it. It's not yeah. there. <laughs> yes, you got you got to free yourself. And I feel really good where I'm at right now. But the thing is, that you, that's don't wish you could have that. No, you don't want to wish to be like me or like your hero. Uh, you want to understand that that's called discipline and work, right? You got to work it so you can do it, but you got to put the work into it. That's the bottom mm -hmm. line there. Yeah. yeah, yeah, nice. Goes back to practice. Practice. Yeah, yeah, but not. But it's interesting because there's practice. Like people practice. Like you know, CEOs are practicing. Uh, you know, snipers are practicing. People practice, but sometimes there's there's a lack. That the vision part is so important. Like, what are you practicing for? You know, what is this? What is your kind of discipline for? Because a lot of people are disciplining themselves so they can be better at doing the status quo. That's part of what I've seen. Yeah, people can discipline themselves to be better killers, but no, it's about integrated skill sets so this is where it goes back to the education system where you, you're in a small discipline and, and one of the questions I ask well if you're this PhD in this one small discipline and you know very very much about very little you don't know how this connects to anything else in the world that's a very bad design of how we mm -hmm. do advanced science today and, and advanced society mm -hmm. it's really bad so we call out for the integration the generalists 
systems thinking that can break through that, that's critical to that. So that needs to happen. So yes, we can train ourselves, but, but we, we want to ask those questions of why uh, by mm -hmm. taking on a bigger perspective perspective yeah. so basically transcend transcendence transcend and include kind of deal oh is that, is that a little wilbur a little yeah that, that's a wilbur thing oh interesting didn't I, I i used to work for wilbur i was oh, uh, in colorado uh, working for his integral institute uh, yeah a yeah very ago. cool i think that's some really cool stuff and when i look at that it's like that also is like okay that's a that's like far out and definitely talking the the language um, mm. But also, I would question like the practice. Okay, how do you apply that to to real life? Absolutely, um, that's that's the that's the biggest question around yeah. that stuff is how do you actually you know bring that kind of meta yeah. theoretical yeah. orientation mystical into yeah. into, into into atoms and you know, into yeah. the world. And one hint, I mean, I'll just throw it. It's uh, I mean, not to you know, uplift OSC here, but our vision. I mean, it helps me so much. Please uplift it. Say it again. Please feel free to uplift it. Yeah, so that is, so uh, I have a mentor who helped define the vision and what I just, I just love it. And it's called OSC's vision. It's about collaborative design for a transparent and inclusive economy of abundance. Hmm. So now anything that I do, I filter through that. Like, okay, was well, that collaborative? Is it inclusive? So, so that statement. I, I mean, I could go on uh, more length what what all of it means, but col collaborative design. The collaborative part is critical because it's about all of us working together. Mm. Um, inclusive and collaborative. Yeah, that's all about open source and distributive. Like we need to include humans and nature. So that's mm. the eco friendly is in there. Abundance mm. is abundance of thinking and economies where abundance is fundamental to the sun providing 10,000 times more power than we use even in our modern wasteful society. We have absolute abundance on first principles. Mm. Somewhere we got stuck where we kind of disconnected from that and we're like, most people I would say are living in a, in a framework of scarcity. So that's the grand awakening that we need to call out for. Beautiful. It feels like a good place to end unless there's something else you want to share. Yeah. So, yeah, I would. I would. And that's to invite Please. people to our work. So right now, the thing that we're doing is, as I mentioned, having noticed that this is not spreading. Well, how do we teach this, uh, generate a collaboratively literate public? So we have two initiatives on that, or three initiatives. So our flow is, so right now we're running all these open source microfactory steam camps where we take average people and teach them the skills of collaborative design for a transparent and inclusive economy of abundance. Really, really that we, we actually get people, you teach them, teach people skills of collaborating, working with CAD, then translating that readily into prototypes using a 3D printer, 3D printer that you build yourself the first day. So you go through this iterative learning process where you go from ideas to reality as an empowering experience. But the biggest thing about that being that you learn that there's a process by which so many people can collaborate and this could be so much greater than yourself. So that's, that's what we're doing. And we're trying to scale that up. Like last event, we ran three locations at the same time. Our goal is to run dozens of these. So you're actually also collaborating with the other groups that are running it in real time. Um, so, so these events are nine days and the last five days we do projects. So imagine you get like 24 locations, 24 people. It's just like 500 people that can be working together in five days. You can do a lot. If you collaborate like that, that's that's the answer to your question. Well, how do you actually get traction of aligning people to go far, pushing a certain project forward? Well, we're recreating, we are creating an explicit structure where that can happen based on the collaborative skills. And then, so that's a nine day experience that we're offering now, either four or nine day experience. And we'll post our next one soon. We're, we're starting to run this every, essentially every month. So we're really getting into the regular wow. programming and then in the summer, starting this summer, we're doing our three months of, if you want to, that deep immersion where you learn more in three months than in your lifetime. That's that. And right after that, uh, so all of this is to get collaboratively literate people so we can all collaborate on the incentive challenge that I mentioned. So that as a real economic experiment that anyone can then take the plans and enterprise plans. And if they really want to, they can make a livelihood if they like. 
So that's that's kind of the nutshell of how we're approaching that to get many people involved in this, build a community where collaboration is now the norm. Nice. Yep. Cool. Well, I, I wish I wish uh, wish your project the best of luck, and I hope to participate at some point in one of your uh, one of your projects. Yeah. So thank you. Thanks again, and yeah, My great pleasure. talking to you. Yeah. You too, Martin. Thank you. Yep. Cool. Okay. Um, so, Merchant, I'll just mention one thing. Um, the system I use, it's going to upload your... Wow. So, you really do have four gigs. It's, it's going fast. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. It's going to upload the WAV file, and it'll be done in just a second um, uh, from the browser, at which point you can... It'll be just like 10 seconds from now. Nice. Yeah. So, what did you think? How did this go? Um, that was, did it kind yeah, of cover what you needed to? or? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Kind of talk to you about some of the sort of, um, yeah, like the interior dimensions of, of what you're doing, because so much of it is, is yeah. so you know focused on the building yeah. of the actual stuff. And yeah. and I know that there, I I had a strong feeling you know that there, there's a there's a deep interior kind of drive you know mm -hmm. that, that drives you and that's driving this project. So, Absolutely. Uh, that was that was beautiful to hear about, yeah, and, and I hope people will kind of check it out and and get you know more tuned into what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. Yeah, and, so, and sorry I won't be able to join you all in Belize this time. I was, yeah, um, no, I was looking forward to the group meditation that you you, you were thinking about um, yeah, same. presenting to us. Uh, wh where could I, is there any group in like in um, Kansas City area that does that? or? Not not yet. Um, so after after I've trained these 40 facilitators that I'm working with now, the, um, some of them may end up doing local groups or local things. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, at the moment, uh, well, we're getting ready to launch an app, a social noting app, which is really just an interface for the community of mm. people who are doing these practices. Yeah. It's, you know, it's an attempt to kind of invite other people in. Like, oh, it's not a, just an app where you listen to guided meditations, an app where you actually meditate out loud. Yeah, no, I mean, I love this. This is like crowd, crowd, crowd spirituality, like crowd builds. I mean, in my view, it's the same thing. So I would actually like to invite you, if you can ever... I mean, in the summer or any other time, I mean, I'd love to s do that with the group to yes, expand that, that dimension group. to the people that are building hardcore stuff here. I, I really would love that, too. Yeah. I mean, I both want to learn what you all are. I want to learn how to build, but I also yeah. that would be something I'd love to, to love to share sometime. Too. Let me ask you, how do you support yourself right now? Is that? Uh, yeah, I support myself primarily through teaching and we use um, the we Buddhism use stuff. Yeah, we yeah, yeah Bud Buddhism and more secular mindfulness, mindfulness kind of along that spectrum, and, and okay. we use we use a, 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 a generosity based model. So all of the 100 percent of what I make is is donation based or generosity based. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and that's been a recent transition, and it's um, it's been a great one. Wow. So are you able so with the generosity model? How is it working? It's working great because um, uh, instead of just doing a sort of give whatever you want, yeah. we we sort of take. It's sort of a bridge model. Uh, I call it transparent generosity, where it's sort of like there's a suggested amount, there's, uh, and then we share all the data we have about about the project or similar ones. Like if you come on a retreat with us, we'll share. This is the average amount that people who've done a retreat of this length with us have given. This is the range. This is the low end. This is the top end. And then ultimately, it's up to you to figure out what you want to give, but with those data points in mind. So that's kind of um, that's helped bridge the gap of sort of the capitalist mindset of like, well, uh, if you say donation, that just means free. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to give you anything. And I, I went through years of, of kind of struggling to, mm -hmm. to make a living as a teacher because people just didn't give me anything. Mm -hmm. And then I, I went to the other side of pay for service and my heart was just like, ah, oh, like I, this, mm -hmm. it's, it's weird that I have a student in Turkey and now who can't have a one-on-one -on -one session with me because it's too expensive for him because their currency is deflated. Mm -hmm. you know, and so that the transparent generosity model has been huh. an attempt to, to kind of bridge bridge the gap or kind of hybrid hybridization. Uh, can you do you have any of this information online for on the, yes. say the price structure of these the retreats? All of, yeah, all of it. All of it is uh, it's on our on our meta site. I can send you a link. Yeah, can you send me? I mean, because one of the things I do these days a lot is study the economic models for for transcendence. This is mm. this is one way. So that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So are cool, you? That's awesome. Let me ask you this. So, so yeah. um, 
so how many how many people do you work with right now and how, how often do you do your retreats just just to get some like real I want to get an understanding of the economics that you go through yeah yes. because so, a lot of so people I mean part of it is that people need to see that to see okay this actually the numbers actually work out in an abundance model yes, yes. it's true yeah, no you're absolutely right, right. Um, so, so yeah, yeah so, so let me I'll send you a link this is this is the training that I did uh, for about 14 months this was the main way I was making a living last year and so you'll see there you know i was working with between 20 and 50 people and they were donating you know roughly around three thirty five hundred to four thousand a month and then i also was working one-on-one -on -one with people and doing you know like a retreat a week-long retreat every quarter and people would donate something like three to five thousand per week for those so, so, you know, all added, added up, up, you know, working full time, working a lot, but still making, you know, like 60 grand a year doing that. So, and my wife does as well. Huh. So the retreat was, sorry, just run through the retreat economics again? Yeah. So with retreats, uh, when we do in-person retreats, we actually, we have, we have some base expenses that we have to pay, like for the retreat center yeah. and, you know, um, the food and everything. But, but our compensation isn't built into the, to the core registration fees so we can keep the registration fees low. The, our, our compensation comes from generosity. So at the end of the retreat, people uh, can give to us directly through the nonprofit, make a tax deductible donation. And that's, the, that's a Buddhist, old, old school Buddhist tradition. Um, so we're just sort of car carrying that forward in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, and people give, you know, an average, I'd say, of around, depending on the retreat, you know, people give an average of like $500 per person for the week, you know, that they've spent with us. Mm -hmm. so that's on top of, that's the donation there? In it, yeah, in addition to the registration fee, food and lodging for the, for the uh -huh. retreat center. How many retreats do you run per year like this? Uh, we only we only run two to three per year, in part because of the carbon footprint of these things. Yeah. You know, so we, we try to focus more on virtual uh, based trainings. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. No, that's good. And we, we we do small retreats too, like fifteen to twenty people per retreat, instead of like a hundred, which a lot of our teachers did this sort of like mass, you know, retreat center model. You just have like churning out people through through these retreats. Mm hmm. Yeah, interesting. No, that's great. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'd love, I'd love to absolutely love to come out sometime in the, uh, to, to the factory farm and. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Participate. That'd be You're great. Welcome. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Okay. Yeah. So my, my best to everyone there. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Take care.